Hello and welcome to worship. Uh, I guess it's been a typical spring week with uh, sun, rain, sun, rain and a dash of wind. Uh, it's a sort of weather that, um, that can have us feeling cooped in. So when we get to singing in a minute, um, I encourage you to jump to your feet or, or at least stand uh, and worship with the Johnstons as they lead us in song. Before we do that though, let's pray together. God, by your Holy Spirit, pull us together that we might be one. Pull us together that though we are meeting and aren't meeting in person, uh, we sense your spirit of joy bringing us together as one people as we worship you. We ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as I promised, the Johnstons uh, will be leading us in two songs this morning. Uh, Jesus is my rock and here I am to worship. And let me say, if you're someone who likes to dance and sing, well, you're at home in your safe space. So it's the perfect time to jump up and have a dance and worship God. Uh, so let's worship God together. Welcome to the Johnston home where we're going to do another couple of songs for you. The first is Jesus is my rock, followed by Here I am to worship.
thank you Ian, Alison, Josh and Manu. Not only is there a lot going on um, in our country, but there's a lot going on around the world. Uh, and so we're going to be praying together for such things. So from another Johnston bubble, uh, we, share, we will share in two prayers. One from Sebastian Johnston and one from Saul. Let's Lord, pray together. Lord, we pray for people in our community who are lonely and worried in lockdown. May they know your peace. We pray for the people who have been affected by the recent terrorist attack in Countdown. We pray for those in hospital and for their families. We pray for the leaders of our country to have wisdom in their decision making concerning COVID. We pray for the people in Afghanistan. Give them strength to cope with all the changes and the trouble in their country. We pray for the people in Louisiana who have been affected by the floods. Help them to be able to clean up their homes so they can live in them again. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, and thank you, Saul. As most of you know, uh, we have a little church in Hunur, which is part of our parish. Um, and one of our team out there, Lynette Denton, has put together a kids' talk for this morning. So let's hear from Lynette now. Good morning, kids. Your nose, this thing here, has a really powerful and sensitive tool. We all have different shaped noses. Some of us have got big nostrils and some of us have got little bulbs at the end of our nose, we've got different bridges of our nose, some have got fat nose, flat noses, long skinny noses, but we all have a nose. Do you know ladies and girls, they have a much stronger sense of smell than boys. We can sniff out anything. Dogs have 40 times greater sense of smell than a person does. And did you know that everyone has their very own unique fingerprint of a smell? Who actually knew that? Smells can bring back memories, good or bad. Can you think of some really good memory smells? Like beautiful flowers, or lemon, or a beautiful dinner that you've had. Can you think of some really bad memory smells? Things that when you think of them, make you gag. Ugh. During this past week, we've had some aromas floating around our house. Some of them were good, and some not so good. There was a smell of popcorn straight from the microwave, and it smells buttery and sweet and corny all at the same time. And I just want to sit and watch a movie before I can eat it even. There was a smell of our beautiful coconut and vanilla candle that seems to spread, it just permeates through our whole living area. Or the smell of the chocolate chip biscuits straight from the oven. Someone in our house couldn't even wait until they cooled down before they took one. Or the smell of chicken frying. Oh, and the smell of burnt potatoes. The pot was black. I scraped the burnt off the potatoes and then tried to camouflage the smell and the taste by mashing them and chopping spring onions in. It didn't really work. We live in a barn, and so we have mouse traps and bait set. And there's a smell of a dead mouse in the shed, and I can't find it. Ooh. Oh, and bathroom smells. We all know who makes the biggest smell in our house. I thought about all these smells when I was reading my Bible during the week. And I came to the verses in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. And it says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. It says that we should have the aroma of Jesus. Now that doesn't mean we need to spray ourselves with perfume. It means we need to give the sweet smell of how Jesus lived his life. The smell of kindness, the smell of caring, the smell of encouragement, the smell of helpfulness, the smell of patience, the smell of forgiveness, the smell of a pure heart, the smell of sharing, 
the smell of humbleness. You know, in lockdown level four, this can be quite hard because we are stuck in the same bubble 24-7 with the same people. But the Bible tells us that we need to have the sweet aroma of Jesus even in lockdown with our family, even if our brothers are being annoying, even if our sisters are being a pain, even if we've got busy mums and dads. When we give out the aroma of Jesus, it makes those around us also drawn to Jesus. On the other hand, no one likes bad smells or bad aromas. We try to avoid these, you know, people who, have got, who are smelly, people who have got bad breath, who have got stinky feet, those people who fart. Stink turns us away from people, and so do our stinky actions turn people away from Jesus. We don't want people to avoid us when it comes to sharing Christ. So our mission this week, yours and mine, is to be the sweet smelling aroma of Jesus. Thank, Thank you. you, Lynette. Uh, a good lesson to remember. Uh, as we get further into spring, uh, we're going to be smelling all the wonderful spring smells. And as you do, remember what Lynette has taught us this morning. As for notices this week, uh, you should have got the newsletter via email. Now, if you haven't, please contact Teresa Matheson via email. It's in our church directory, uh, and she will get it one to you. Also, please note that on the 30th of October, we're due to have our pizza night. Um, now, that is lockdown, le lockdown levels dependent. Otherwise, we will push that event out to the next available Saturday until we get into December so that we can gather together and have fun with the pizza and quiz. Uh, for the rest of the notices, um, and some gorgeous pictures of some lambs, um, arvids and lambs, um, check out the newsletter. Before returning to singing, I want to acknowledge the offerings which we give. Now, the pursuit of money, um, Spending it and, and gaining it consumes a good portion of our lives. And bringing a portion of what we have not only gives resources for God's work to be done, but internally it is a significant symbol of our submission to God as our King. So, let's bring our offerings before God and pray a blessing upon them. Let's pray together. Lord God, we bring before you the money we almost exclusively give online at the moment. We bring before you the time we give calling and supporting members of this congregation and those beyond it. We bring before you the videos we produce, which keep us connected in this time of isolation and help us worship you. Over all, we pray your blessing. May what we give be a blessing beyond our intentions and understanding, that others might know the blessings we do and in turn turn to you and worship you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's sing some more songs. Jessica, lead us. Good morning. I have two songs for us this morning. They're both more worshipful and more restful. Take a moment to sit and rest in the presence of God as we sing these songs together. The first song I have for you today is Forever by Carrie Jo.
thank you God just continue to stay in this moment of restful worship remember God remember your God the God who chose you before you knew that you were even gonna be a sparkle in your mother and father's eyes the God who called you the God who loved you the God who wanted you from the very start that God that God is the God that died for you on the cross bring this knowledge into our next song. It's called Worshipping You by Deluge.
Jessica. Amen. Our scripture today comes to us from Richard Archer. Thank you, Richard. Greetings from the Archer household to our Pepsi brothers and sisters in Christ. Today's reading is James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Controlling the tongue. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Richard. Before I share, let's pray together. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. So, James starts off this uh, chapter 3 of his epistle uh, with a concern for those who are seeking to become teachers, teachers within the church. This was a time within the church that many were seeking the role of Christian teacher. To these teachers, James, James's words aren't a command, but clearly come from a place of concern at the lack of seriousness and education with which Christians were pursuing the role of teaching. Those who teach will be judged more strictly, James says. And though we should consider this to mean spiritually judged, that is, judged by God, it should also be understood as a pastoral concern for those seeking to be Christian teachers as well. Teachers of any topic are judged more strictly and harshly than those who solely participate in a subject. Take, for instance, school, school teachers. They are judged by the students, students' parents, and society at large. Students, perhaps uh, more in secondary level, say things like, what would my teacher know? Parents say things like, teachers, the teacher isn't teaching what my child needs to be taught. And society mocks teachers who spell things wrong on protest signs when they're on strike for higher wages. So in essence, James wants those who desire to be teachers in the Christian church to consider carefully if they are really up for the challenge of Christian teaching. He then follows this concern with traits which a Christian leader must have. We, he says, implying himself as a teacher, we stumble. Now to state such a fact shows that to be a Christian teacher, as James was, there is a strong element of humility 
required for the role. Amplifying this, James says, and I'll read it from the message translation here, if you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. Jesus, of course, was a perfect person, but James isn't meaning him in this situation. James is stating that there really is no perfect person. Also, this statement, uh, through this statement, James introduces and highlights that language, the key mode of communication for a Christian teacher, is one which is imperfect. And there is no perfect Christian teacher. And thus, anyone thinking they could be or claiming to be perfect, a perfect Christian teacher, should in fact not be trusted. Humility and acknowledging mistakes are traits of a true Christian teacher and virtues we should look for in our Christian teachers. Further developing the importance of language and more specifically the tongue, James gives two illustrations of the powerful influence of the tongue. The first is the power of a bit in a horse's mouth. Now, I doubt there are many these days who can truly grasp the implications of what James is saying here. Because we don't use horses in everyday life anymore, do we? And yet horses remain powerful creatures. A single Clydesdale, which you perhaps have heard of, can pull between 900 and 3,600 kgs. That's like pulling a 1990 Honda Civic or a Hummer with six passengers in it. Now at the time of James writing his letter, horses were used for traveling, plowing fields, pulling loads, and in battles, uh, those on a horse had an unmatched advantage over those on foot. First readers of James's letter, and for many generations after, now they understood what James was getting at. For us, however, it is unlikely that a bit is understood by us. It, it's perhaps a bit foreign in modern day, in our modern day. But an equivalent of a horse perhaps would be a car. Though there are many things which come together to make a car move without a steering wheel, well, you're not going to get close to where you want your car to go. And I pray that you never have the experience of your steering wheel breaking while driving because, as you can imagine, it would end in a mess. A steering wheel like a bit, though small in comparison to the size of the vehicle, has extraordinary power over the direction a car goes. That is the power of the tongue in relationship to a person's direction. Following that up and bringing greater emphasis, James's second example of the power of the tongue is that of a ship. Being that we are an island nation, we perhaps understand this re re uh, reference a little more. But have a look at this picture. That is pretty much a st standard container ship rudder. It's something like two stories high, but controls a ship that is 300 meters long. That's three rugby fields end to end long. By comparison, the rudder is tiny. Most of the time, no matter how strong the winds are and the size of a ship, save the ever given, a ship's pilot using the rudder can get a large ship wherever they need it to go. Rudders and steering wheels are amazingly small compared to the power they have on that which they direct. 
that same point Jesus wants us to understand. The tongue, it has the power over the whole of us, which is unequaled by any other body part. Now note that neither of these two examples which James gives are painted in a negative light, but rather example the sheer power of the tongue. The negative side of the tongue James hammers home with two more illustrations. The first, the boastful nature of the tongue. And the second, the tongue's ability to cause devastation is exampled by a forest fire started from a single spark. And going on, Paul, a uh, Paul, James pulls no punches. He says, it's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It, it is itself set on fire by hell. Now, in saying these words, perhaps James is recalling instances where his own tongue had gotten away from him. Fights with family, arguments with friends, disagreements with fellow believers. He's saying for the Christian teacher, the tongue or control of the tongue is of utmost importance. For the Christian teacher, the tongue is a thing to be tamed. And yet, James quite rightly says, that is impossible. No human being can tame the tongue, he says. And he follows the statement up with a damning indictment on all believers. With our tongues we praise God and curse those made in God's image. Clearly a problem 2,000 years ago that neither enlightenment nor technology can produce a solution for. We, like those James first wrote to, are guilty of exactly that charge. With our tongues we praise God and curse those made in God's image. Speaking rhetorically and with a tone of bewilderment, James continues and rounds out this piece of scripture with examples of the problem of uncontrolled tongues for believers. Salt springs can, can't produce fresh water, he says. Although technology might argue with that assertion these days, I think we can recognize the point of what James is saying in his time what comes from the tongue is a sign of whom we belong to and reflects the God we serve. From the tongue, true worship cannot come if it is the place where curses come from too. In this scripture, in the first part of the scripture, James is primarily focused with Christian teachers and his concern for them. Something which I take to heart. Yet, the further he progresses with his discourse, the direction of his language moves to include all believers with a focus on the tongue. And so, from what J James wrote, today I want to touch on three points. The first, be careful because you are already a teacher. The second, your tongue is problematic. And the third, upgrade your steering wheel. So, how are you already a teacher? For those of us who are parents, we probably don't need much convincing on this one, especially during lockdown. And almost... Almost, and most likely, we have seen the fruits of our teaching in a couple of ways. Perhaps we have proactively prioritized certain behaviors in our children and been very pleased when our children respond in the way we have taught them. Walking, talking, eating, potty training. Those are some of the rudimentary ones. But perhaps manners are something that we have taught. Or, or waiting for everybody else to be seated before starting a meal. Praying and reading the Bible, perhaps. Playing a specific sport, which you like. 
There are plenty of things that we as parents proactively teach our children, but then there are other things which we don't proactively teach our children, which they learn from us. When we see our children doing those things, we say things like, I don't act like that, do I? Or, I don't sound like that, do I? Children learn from us whether we like it or not. We are teachers whether we like it or not. Even those of us who aren't parents teach intentionally and unintentionally in similar ways. Through the way you are as an uncle or an aunt, neighbour or friend, or work colleague, you teach. And spiritually, as Christians, we teach what Christ is like through our words and behaviours to others, whether we like it or not. So, though we may not be seeking the positions, uh, a position as a teacher, Christian teacher, which James begins this message with, we are in fact Christian teachers. And we are likely more educated in Christianity than th those who Joan, James first wrote to. So this means James is called to take the role of Christian teacher seriously is to each of us. And we should note that we will be judged more strictly by God and by our society. What's more, as teachers, we must approach the way we teach with humility and acknowledge that we get things wrong. We by no means are perfect, are we? We know someone who's perfect, and we should be saying to people, would you like to hear about this perfect person I know? But the moment, moment we think or pretend that we are perfect, we have made a significant error. We, as well-educated believers, with so much available to us in the form of Bibles, Bible studies, the internet, educated fellow believers, can't brush aside our responsibility as Christians' teachers, saying, saying things like, Christian teaching, that's, that's above my pay grade. And neither can we engage with teaching in a blasé way. It, it's too important. James calls us to take our role as Christian teachers seriously. What's more, James calls us to take seriously our problematic tongues. Your tongue is problematic. And perhaps you know it. Perhaps you are someone who thinks sometimes, oh, I wish I hadn't have said that on those occasions when dumb or hurtful things jump out of your mouth. If you're someone who feels regret at saying the wrong thing, I believe it's actually a spiritual gift. To feel regret over words which have danced off your tongue is a good response because it means that you care about those who you who you talk to and don't mean the perhaps dumb or hurtful things that you sometimes say. You know the hurt. We know the hurt we can do with our tongues, don't we? And James's words should resonate with us, right? We should nod our heads at his words in the knowledge of the hurt we have caused, but also at the hurt caused by us. And upon our recognition of the hurt that the tongue causes, we should both be careful at the way we use our tongue and also show compassion to those who have not yet reigned in their tongues. That is not to say that we should overlook abuse demeaning or nasty behavior, but rather accept that our brothers and sisters make mistakes too. They have problematic tongues. So do our family, friends and work colleagues. And when we understand such things, the thoughtless barbs and direct attacks on us can mean less. And we can respond in a different way, perhaps in a grace-filled way. This doesn't, however, mean that we don't need to upgrade our steering wheel. No human can tame the tongue, James says, which means we as Christians need to seek another way. 
the way of Christ. See, on the cross, suffering emotional, physical and spiritual torture, Jesus doesn't berate or call down fire on those who put him there. He prays for them. Father, forgive them, Jesus says. The fire of our tongues quickly turns to a bonfire when someone cuts us off in traffic. Or we shake our fists at them for such a minor transgression. But we must seek a different way. Jesus is the example we are to follow. The upgrade we need to make is that of making Jesus our steering wheel. Not asking him to take the wheel, no. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is about embodying Jesus Christ. Living like he did, being guided by the Holy Spirit. Turning the vehicle, which is us, the way Jesus wants us to go. A way that is good and beneficial. For not just us, but all. So when our tongues would have us saying a hurtful thing, we pause and think of something else to say, or say nothing at all. That's perhaps when we say it best. By making Jesus our steering wheel, our whole being will move in a different direction. We will no longer be at the whim of our tongues. Now that's a task, obviously, that's easier said than done. Forgive the pun. And it's actually a spiritual discipline that we need to practice daily because we do mess up, don't we? We are being made perfect, so not perfect yet. But also on the, ju but also on the journey to perfection, we need to think uh, sorry, when we think we have upset someone or know we have hurt someone, we with Jesus as our steering wheel, we can go to them, apologize. And recognizing this sort of mistake, it can show that we care about the other person and they may recognize that. So acknowledge and take seriously that you are a Christian teacher. Acknowledge that your tongue is problematic and upgrade your steering wheel. Daily look to Jesus and seek God's direction in your life. Amen. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for your brother James and his letter which he wrote and guides us and helps us to live our lives as believers. Help us to make our Christ, Christ, take our Christian teaching seriously. Guide us to humility with our problematic tongues. And whenever we see a steering wheel, may we remember that as believers, we are to seek your way, not our own. Bless us with wisdom as we serve you. In Jesus' name we, pr name we pray. Amen. To send us out this week, we once again have the song that Latifale Leviasa Ne Abaa wrote from a section of Psalm 51. Let's reflect on the message as Latifale and Sarah Millwood minister to us. Enjoy. <laughs>
Thank you, Lada Fale and Sarah. If you want prayer for anything, please touch base with me via phone, email, or Facebook. If you'd like to listen to any of the songs from this morning, links to them will be in the description below. Now, though, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in peace.